So hi, everyone. My name is Lindsay Ringette, and I'm the Director of Marketing at ISA Cybersecurity. Thank you for joining us today for Cyber on a Shoestring. Before we begin the discussion, I'll share a few quick housekeeping notes. First, this event is being recorded, and the recording will be made available after. Second, there will be time for a Q&A at the end. Please put your questions in the Q&A feature and note which panelists the question is for. We'll do our best to get to everyone's questions, but if we run out of time, we'll send a follow-up email with answers to any questions that we didn't get to. Third, as you can see, there is a chat function, and we encourage you all to interact with other guests there, but please ensure you only put questions for the panelists in the Q&A feature. Okay. I now have the pleasure of introducing our moderator, Phil Armstrong. Phil is the president and CEO of Macanthium Ventures, a board and advisory technology investment company. In March 2021, he retired from his position as EVP and Global CIO of Great West Life Co., Canada's oldest life insurance company with over $2 trillion in assets under administration. Phil is a seasoned corporate director, strategic advisor, founder, and fintech investor with over 40 years of global financial services experience. In 2022, Phil was inducted into the CIO Hall of Fame as its first and only Canadian-based CIO. InsureTech Magazine described him as the world's third most influential InsureTech leader. Over to you, Phil. Thank you, Lindsay. Pleasure to be here. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today uh, for what's going to be a fascinating conversation on cyber on a shoestring. We have assembled an amazing panel for you today. But before we get into the panel, and before uh, I ask the panelists to introduce themselves, I think what we'll do is switch it up a little bit and engage the audience right away. Maybe what I'd like to do is just pop a quick question out to you in the form of a poll, and just ask you what's on your mind uh, for your upcoming budget season that's about to start, your planning and budget season. You can select as many of these boxes as you want, but just quickly indulge us and tell us what, what are you thinking about in terms of your 2022 cyber budget and priorities for next year? And then when the poll comes back, uh, this may shape some of the answers from our panelists. Just take a quick moment to pick a couple of these that are top of mind for you as you enter into 2022. And do we have the results? Survey says, wow, look at this. Oh, that you, popped off. There we go. Can you see them? We can see them now, yeah. So as, as I'm looking at this, a lot of you are thinking about um, increasing endpoint protection, maybe changing technologies around endpoint protection. Cloud security obviously is a big concern for everybody. Uh, lots of different angles around cloud security, identity and access management, future state architectures, threat intelligence and threat hunting. Very interesting. Look at that. So we weren't too far off on, uh, on what we thought. We did a little bit of a prediction around this. So that's, that's interesting. All right, let's close that poll. Thank you for doing that. So as we start to get into our live chat, let's, uh, let's introduce our panelists today. I think what we'll do is we'll start with uh, an introduction from Sean. Sean, would you like to go first and introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thank you, Phil. I'm Sean Guthrie. I'm the former Senior Director of Information Technology at AUMA, which is Alberta Urban Municipalities Association. I'm also, I also have the pleasure of being the new Vice President of the CIO Association of Canada. At AUMA, I created a new managed technology service business unit, which was designed to provide its members with cost-effective managed cybersecurity solutions, as well as managed IT services, leveraging our economies of scale. And can't wait to share a little bit more of that later. Thank you, Sean. Vivian? Hi, everyone. I'm Vivian Soon. I'm a cybersecurity architect at IBM. 
I work with customers across the country, both large and small, advising them on cybersecurity strategies, technologies, and investments. Thank you, Vivian. Over to Michael. Hi, my name is Michael Luters. I'm Senior Vice President of Commercial Insurance and Risk Management at ProLink Insurance. Uh, we are a uh, boutique-ish uh, specialty insurance brokerage with a specialty in knowledge base industries with a particular expertise in cyber risk management insurance. Uh, what we do is we seek to understand the objectives uh, of our and risk profile of our clients. And then we use risk management and insurance tools to help our clients achieve their objectives and gain more control over their insurance program. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And then Enza. Thanks, Phil. Um, I'm Enza Alexander. I'm the Executive Vice President at ISA. Uh, we have the pleasure of, of being your host today. I have been with ISA for just approximately three years now. Uh, prior to that, I did have an opportunity to work really in three regions of, of the globe in IT and communications and cyber related executive roles. And it's interesting how, you know, cyber was important in the early 90s as we were deploying, you know, new websites and really changing what we knew to be the digital footprint of our assets. And I'm really excited to be part of ISA today, where we are really looking at risk mitigation and helping our customers navigate their way through the complexities and the changing landscape of cybersecurity. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Enza. Thank you, panelists. Um, as we start to move into the new planning year and the new budgeting season, maybe I can ask a question to all the panelists. We'll start with Sean. Um, but all of the panelists, uh, I'd like you to take a, a crack at answering this, please. What's the most convincing argument to get additional budget and resources for building a cybersecurity strategy? I think, uh, you know, I think the most convincing argument is the one that addresses the risk to the organization. If you want that additional uh, budget and resourcing, you must understand what keeps the executive and, and the board members up at night. Um, whether that's loss of revenue, loss of productivity, or in, in our organization before was the reputation of our organization. <clears throat> Whatever uh, is critical to your organization from that business perspective is what's going to lend well to your argument. Uh, you need to really be able to demonstrate that impact uh, of a loss to the organization in these business terms. And lastly, and I think this is probably the most important, it has to be in clear language. You can't use jargon when you're uh, having these conversations with your executives or board. Yeah, risk, impact and loss certainly gets everybody's attention and, and delivering the message clearly, I think, is, is key. Michael, what's your perspective? Yeah, I think the communication has to be around acknowledging what in many cases are probably your two largest assets as an organization, which is your data and, and what Sean just mentioned, which is your reputation. You know, most organizations today are data-driven organizations, uh, technology-driven organizations. If you don't have access to your technology, if you don't have access to your data, you really can't do anything. If you lose access to your technology, and especially if you lose access to your data, the valuation of your organization and your ability to service your customers and stakeholders, et cetera, you know, disappear. And then on the reputation side, it's a, it's an intangible asset, but it's a really important asset because it's not that I think that the general public doesn't recognize that. I think they do recognize that things can happen, but how you react to those and how prepared you are, uh, how you handle the communication, you know, whether you took all reasonable steps to manage it are things that if all those things are in place, your you can actually come out of these things with your reputation intact. Yeah, I love that you came at this from a different angle, data and reputational risk. Enza? You know, really understanding that there is evidence that feeds into how your cybersecurity strategy is aligned with your business objectives is always key. Funding specific projects, uh, the people, the capacity and the skills, the talent to help you maintain that well thought out strategic plan, call it a roadmap, that has the different initiatives that will continue to enhance your cyber maturity 
and reduce your risk of vectors. And looking really at your industry specifics as well and gathering the data from, the, from your very specific sector to understand what others may also be deploying or employing in their businesses today. So it's really about being able to have the evidence on, you know, what are your crown jewels and how can you consistently uh, fund both capacity and skill to be able to really reduce your threat factors. Yeah, so when you're scrambling around and trying to fight for resources, especially at budget allocation time, uh, scarce resources that everyone's trying to get their hands on. Um, I do think it's, it's interesting. We've heard a nice balance between risk management and strategic alignment with the company's priorities and both are very, very important. Vivian? Uh, yeah, I'm so glad you asked this question. I had a visual for this, Lindsay, if you can bring that up. So we're just having a bit of a, a tech issue. Michelle is going to bring the <gasps> slide deck back up. Okay. <laughs> All right. So while I wait for my amazing visual for what I want to say, I just <laughs> wanted to respond um, to um, something that Michael said, you know, to Michael's point, it's not very hard to look at organizations who've been breached and see like who did the response well and who didn't. Um, when we think about who ha didn't handle it well, everyone looks at Equifax as an example of an organization that got breached and was really not effective in the way they handled it. On the other hand, if you look at like Maersk and Norsk Hydro, these are two companies who were attacked, but actually emerged from that with their reputation, not only intact, but it was, you know, a boost to them because of transparency and the efficiency with which they handled that incident. Um, when, you know, if you're trying to figure out like what's the strongest argument for asking for more budget or more resources, I'm going to be contentious. I'm going to say, how can you afford not to? Um, you know, if you either, you're either going to have to pay up front to have those defenses in place, or you're going to have to pay a lot more money in ransom or in recovery. Uh, every year, IBM commissions a, a study from the Ponemon Institute on the cost of a data breach. And we survey organizations all around the world. I'm going to talk more uh, during this event about the findings of those studies specific to Canada. But the bottom line is, you really can't afford not to have those defenses in place. Uh, there we go. There's my awesome visual. <laughs> you know, you can pay for the proactive countermeasures up front, or you can get hit on the back end with that ransom because you weren't prepared and you're not able to recover or remediate. Um, my next slide, if we can quickly bump to that, I know I only have a few seconds before we need to move on. Um, some shocking, maybe shocking findings from our study is that Canada is the third most breached region in the world and has been for a few years now. Our, our performance in the study has been very, very consistent. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But on average, it costs Canadian organi organizations six up to $6.75 million to recover from a data breach. So can you afford that recovery cost or would you rather invest in defenses up front? Thank you, Vivian. We do have a few uh, more minutes uh, on this question. I'll throw it back out to the panel at large. Anybody uh, got any tips and tricks around what they've used in their past uh, that's been particularly effective in garnering resources or getting attention from management that funnels those resources into advancing the cyber uh, agenda within your organization? I'm happy to chime in on that. I think it. I think when you're trying to get attention or you're trying to get an allocation of resources, it's really important to make sure that when you're talking about it, you're aligning it with the top strategic objectives of the organization. Because if it just sits out here as just an expense and an intangible, and we can't really measure or in any way quantify the value of it, then it, it, it makes it very difficult to get approved. But if you can tie it and say, well, listen, we're spending a whole whack of money here, resources here, we're hiring the best talent in the industry here. But if you realize that if these sort of scenarios happen, that investment is lost. So I think when you align them, you, you're going to have a much better uh, result. Yeah, perfect. So the alignment and making making the allocation of those resources tangible, 
Uh, and, and often people forget to build in how you measure that, that business value. So make sure you're thinking about how not just getting the money and getting the investment and doing the initiative and closing down uh, the gap or addressing the risk, but how do you measure that? And then how do you play that back in a, in a closed loop back to management so that they feel good about their investment and they can see that uh, it was worthwhile. So that's excellent. So moving on to our second question then uh, for the panel. How do small and medium-sized businesses and public sector organizations obtain cybersecurity services and protection at a cost that's affordable? Perhaps, Sean, maybe you'd like to take the first stab at that. Yeah, um, thanks, Phil. My, you know, my perspective is really going to come from what we did at AUMA uh, by creating these managed cybersecurity solutions and, and really using AUMA's economy of scale. What we did is, you know, we to put this program together, we did it based on feedback from our members and, and where they were, you know, indicating that this is a challenge as we're talking about that, you know, how do we get these affordable services at a cost that's actually effective and, and something that we can afford. I uh, was also based on the fact that we're seeing municipalities and public sector organizations in the news being attacked. Uh, and that's further substantiated by what Vivian just showed by Canada being that third country that's most breached. And so that kind of, that brought this kind of, you know, to the forefront for, for our organization and how could we help. So we generated this new business unit that allowed us to secure pricing through a partner um, uh, that was at uh, a price that our members would be able to afford if, versus if they were to go at it alone. So my recommendation for these type of organizations would be to find a similar organization like AUMA. I know that AUMA has got uh, sister organizations across across Canada, uh, but I also know that AUMA is the only one right now that has created these services and that partnership uh, just to really allow to tap into those cost savings. And this you know, allows the organizations to afford that what I'll call enterprise level services at a cost that's more affordable. I will say that um, there are many free examples or, or sorry, free resources out there that um, that you should do and that you should look at. So example is the government of Canada is really good from their Canadian center of cybersecurity. They've got lots of free resources. You know, there's threat intelligent newsletters and, and things like that. But what I say is that the problem isn't necessarily the wealth of information and the wealth of guidance that's out there. It's organizations don't have the resources or the skills to act upon any of the information that comes from these resources. So it just becomes more of that noise and frustration and really doesn't move the organizations forward in a meaningful way through their cyber journey. Um, and I'll end kind of on another area of opportunity is that as far as resources go that we were just talking about, there's, you know, there's options like a VCIO or fractional CISO. Sorry, I said VCIO, I meant VCISO which is Chief Information Security Officer, I think this is a really good cost-effective way to get those senior security resources in that, that short term or for a few hours a week that can help create that, that roadmap or, or to, access, uh, to assess where, where you are in your cybersecurity journey. So I'd say those are the couple of the resources from my perspective that, um, uh, that would help out those small businesses as well as uh, public sector orgs. Yeah, perfect. I mean, cybersecurity as a topic has elevated itself into the boardroom, it's into the management discussion, it's in the press and the media. Um, and so what that's done is it, it's garnered a lot of attention into our industry. And, and the competition is fierce uh, to attract staff and, and retain staff. It's getting harder than ever. Um, so I was just kind of wondering, and maybe Enza, you could take a stab at this one. How can small and medium sized businesses and public sector organizations actually find affordable ways to compete uh, in, in this, this all out war to attract top cyber talent? I think that, you know, ensuring that you are working with an organization that understands your industry, that has the experience and the people that can really maximize the efficiencies, um, having really that blueprint, that, that future state architecture, the engineering expertise, the operations portion of it, these all become key criteria in being able to, you know, deliver those critical initiatives into your business. 
it is a known fact that talent is becoming more and more challenging um, in cybersecurity as innovation moves very quickly. And, you know, individual consultants and practitioners, the professional services teams are doing the best that they can, can to really tool up and understand those. But to work with a firm that has the ability to have 10 and 20 year experienced um, consultants and practitioners that can assist should reduce the amount of time to the outcomes and the success. Also leveraging specific skill sets to augment your own team where you are continuing to bring your folks through the journey, your people, which are an asset to your organization, and continuing to build their knowledge and allowing them to work with more senior individuals that are helping them not only build their technical knowledge, but build some expertise around the area and they can become passionate about the work that they will continue to operate and engineer with you day to day even when bringing in external talent. So it's hard to find, but if you find the right organization that has done it before, they will reduce the amount of time to delivering the right outcomes to your business, which is why those projects are on your roadmap to begin with. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Enza. So let's assume then that we've made a compelling argument and we've got the resources, we've gone into the budgeting process, our initiatives and plans have been approved. We look at our team and we're fortunate enough to have a great team of cyber professionals ready to execute on our, on our, uh, our plans uh, and that things are going well for us. Um, and and we go upstairs and we try to sort of socialize this and, and execute on our plans. And we find out that we were not as successful as we thought we were going to be. And obviously, I think if you don't have the right cybersecurity protection in place in your organization, there's going to be a cost to that. And so I was interested in, you know, what is the cost of not having appropriate cybersecurity measures in place? And I think we've got the perfect panelists to answer that one. Vivian, what are you seeing in terms of the cost of a cyber breach and, and the cost of not having appropriate cyber security measures in place? Yeah, so we talk a lot in security operations about left of boom and right of boom. So you have that boom moment, right? That's the moment that you've uncovered, you know, whatever the breach is. Um, and if you go back to my previous slide with the, the one before this with the um, summary of the Canadian findings, uh, you know, you kind of have to make that choice of where you're going to prepare. Are you going to, you have to prepare before the event, you have to have proactive security in place, but you also have to have your incident response and all that, that ex post response stuff in place as well. That's also an investment. So in the study, and I should clarify, when I say that Canada is number three, it means that we have the third highest breach cost in the world. Uh, and you know, it, it's the same as we perform, we did last year in the study. In fact, in all of the major areas of study in our cost of a data breach, uh, Canada has been very consistent. Um, we're not trending any better or worse than we have in previous years. So I guess that's a solid bronze medal performance. Um, you know, the, the thing that you have to bear in mind is that hope is not a strategy and no one is too small to be attacked. If you remember the WannaCry virus, you know, I have, a, I have a colleague who went to try and buy paint at his local paint store in Aurora. And he went in and he said, I'm looking for this paint. And the guy said, look, I can sell you paint if it's like something I've got, but I can't custom mix anything for you because I got this virus and my one computer in my entire store is locked up. I mean, it's a mom and pop paint shop in the GTA and they were shut down and couldn't operate and had to pay the ransom. No one is too small to be attacked. So, you know, yeah, it's not gonna cost the Aurora paint store six and a half million dollars to recover from that. But, you know, the, the lost business opportunity, the disruption, you probably don't have a lot of super tech savvy people around to help you get your systems back online either. So the remediation cost is significant for a business like that. No one's too small to be attacked. Uh, and if you go to the, the next chart that I had from the, um, from the study, you know, we're trending about pretty consistently over the years. 
uh, in, in the, the data breach components. But for sure, the largest expense components when you're looking at what data breaches cost uh, Canadian organizations, the largest components are, first of all, that lost business cost. And secondly, all that effort in the detection and escalation, all of that right of boom scramble of, oh crap, something's happened. What is it? How fast is it spreading? How do we shut it down? Um, you know, not so much the recovery, but the detection and the escalation is fairly consistently the single most expensive component of a data breach for Canadian organizations. And again, this is consistent over five years. So if we know that this is what happens in our country, in our cyber landscape, then there are things that we can do about that. I love that quote that hope is not a strategy. I always use the word luck is the residue of design. And I think what, what the message I'm getting out of your, your answer there was that uh, you can't hide behind the statement that I'm too small to be attacked anymore. The cyber criminals are going after everybody. And in fact, in many ways, they're targeting uh, the less prepared. Um, they can get more success at that level. Maybe the ransom is smaller, but uh, they're doing more of it. And so uh, it's, it's quite profitable and we can see that in the numbers, um, which is really interesting. Um, so what are some of the key risk management controls that insurers are looking for, Michael? Um, you know that I've uh, spent most of my career working in insurance companies. Mm -hmm. and, and where should small and medium-sized businesses and public sector organizations focus first uh, if they're thinking of managing their risk? Yeah, and I, I'll make these comments very general because they can vary a little bit depending on you know, what business you're in and, you know, whether you're government or you're in healthcare or, or whatever it happens to be. So I'll just kind of generalize and say that because the insurance industry has lost so much money on cyber insurance in the last couple of years, they're really scrambling to try and determine what are the best risk management controls that they need to see in order for one, to make people even insurable. And number two is even if you're insurable, what are the things that they that can be put in place that are going to minimize the impact and the cost of, of, a, of a claim if it in fact happens? And I would say in general terms, the four things that insurers are looking for today, number one would be multi-factor authentication. Passwords are no longer secure. That's pretty widely recognized now. And so multi-factor authentication is a really, uh, and we're talking about, you know, doing things on a shoestring. Uh, multi-factor authentication does not need to be and doesn't have to be a very expensive solution to implement. But what it does do is when it comes to access to your network and access to your applications externally, putting that extra step in to, to make sure that you're authenticating yourself in another way other than just your password is a very easy and simple thing that you can put in place. And I would say by next year in 2022, I would, in my opinion, if you don't have multi-factor authentication, you could, you will largely be uninsurable. That's just the way it's going. Number two is encryption. Encrypting all your data at rest and ensuring all your data is encrypted while it's, it's moving over the internet or over your network. That's again, not necessarily a very expensive thing you know, to put in place. But what the encryption does is it just makes it more difficult for people to snoop on you. Uh, number three would be employee training. We know that most of the incidences that occur are not a fault of the technology. It's usually the fault of a human, somebody making a poor decision around clicking on a link or opening up an attachment to an email. So training your employees to raise their, ed to raise their awareness so that when they're looking at something that they have enough information that they would pause before they do before they click on that link or before they open up that attachment is so critical to protecting yourself and again this type of education or awareness training of your employees is not necessarily expensive but it's a very easy thing that you can do to minimize the potential of something happening and the last thing I would say that insurers are starting to look at, I'd say it's an emerging thing, is an air gap in your backup. What do I mean by an air gap? The 
the criminals have gotten very good. They now attack your backup first. So before they make themselves uh, make themselves known, they they will oftentimes ensure that your backups are first of all are encrypted, and then they will make themselves known. Because in the past, people would just say, "Oh, I got hit. I'm just going to wipe it all out, and I'll just restore everything from a backup." So now to get you to pay. They say, that's fine. Go check your backups and your backups are in fact encrypted. So having a backup that's not connected to your network, and that could be sitting on an external drive or on a thumb drive or on a tape or whatever it happens to be, is a good risk management measure to ensure that you can uh, recover from an incident like that that's happening. Um, and in fact, these four things that I've just outlined are available on a white paper. If you go to prolink.insure, you can download the white paper and we talk about all four of these in more detail. Hey, Michael, quick question for you. I'm just going to put you on the spot here, though. Um, you mentioned that cyber insurance uh, insurers uh, are not having a fun time right now, and, and, and they're losing their shirt a little bit. And so they're having to tighten up on, on the requirements that's within a cyber insurance uh, contract. For those people that are thinking about cyber insurance, could you share with the audience like what is the state of the nation? What is the loss ratios that cyber insurers are looking at right now? Is it sort of like I bring a dollar in in premiums, but I have to pay $3 out? Is it a one to three, one to five? What are the rough numbers that they're looking at right now? Yeah, great question, Phil. So in 2020 in Canada, for every $1 the insurance industry brought in in, in, in premium for cyber insurance, they paid out $4 in claims. <laughs> so very unsustainable model. Now in 2021, it looks like that's improved a little bit. It looks like we're trending to be $3 in claims for every $1 in premium. So still a very unsustainable model. Yeah. So that's why uh, I prefaced my, my four recommendations or thoughts with it's a bit of a moving target because right now the insurers are not sure exactly what the risk management controls need to be. So they're basically insisting upon various things and it can vary from insurer to insurer, but they're starting to insist upon these things in the hope that, and only time will tell, that by having these things in place, it will reduce the frequency of claims and the severity of claims. But they don't know, you know, it's only time will tell. That does not sound like a sustainable model. And I don't think a lot of people quite understand the economics behind that. All they see is that when they try to get cyber insurance, that there's caveats and there's more restrictions coming. And it's because that product is becoming challenging to be profitable um, for the insurers themselves. Interesting. Um, let's move on to our next question then. And uh, this one is uh, directed to Sean. So Sean, with so many different solutions that address people, process, and technology, like where does someone in the small to medium-sized businesses or public sector start when they're building their cybersecurity strategy? I can see that one of the questions that popped into the chat, into the, the Q&A section was, hey, look, if I'm starting from scratch or I've got a really immature organization that I've just joined, it's so overwhelming. Where do you start? Absolutely. I, and before I answer, I just wanted to touch on something that Michael and Vivian were talking about, but Vivian saying not too small of an organization can be attacked and Michael talking about insurance. We've seen at AUMA some of our municipalities be denied insurance because they don't have some of those four controls in place that Michael was talking about. Example, MFA, that's table stakes and it doesn't cost a lot and it should be done. So I just wanted to kind of reinforce that we're seeing those examples. Yeah, great but, point. Yeah, and so to the question, you know, my my recommendation, and I've done this in, in every organization that I've joined, and, and in fact, I'm just about to start doing this in the organization that I've just joined in the last week and a half here is, is without a doubt, getting a threat risk assessment done or a cybersecurity assessment based on a framework like the CIS critical security controls. Now, you know, I get this is cybersecurity on a shoestring, and I know that this would be an investment, but hear me out, and this is why I think this is important. This upfront investment, uh, the benefits will really help guide the cybersecurity journey and the necessary spend based on the gaps that you may or may not be aware of and that we've been talking about through this, this panel. I often find, and I've gone into many organizations that are playing whack-a-mole when it comes to security. They're just throwing money at more hardware or they're throwing more money at solutions without actually getting the impact that they're looking for. They're just maybe uneducated or just not necessarily directing the spend where it needs to go. So 
you know, getting a measure on where your organization is ba is at based on these in the CIS framework, these 18 controls will be an eye-opening journey and it will it will give you the direction based on the risk tolerance of your organization. So, you know, what I mean by that is that is that once you've done this report, you'll actually understand where your risk is. And it could, you know, it it might not necessarily be um you know, it might not necessarily be you need to upgrade your firewalls or you need an endpoint protection program. It might be something with respect to data management. And, you know, I find that that not all of these controls will apply to the specific industry that you're in. But in the end, again, you'll have that st starting point uh, and you'll be able to measure the journey with where you're at. And so I, I really can't stress this enough. It's, you know, in my experience, it's been the quickest way to understand where you are today. Uh, and it gives a way to measure those improvements. And so Phil, you talked about it earlier about the ability to measure and track your progress and your success because you need to report that back in. And so if you do this, you have that starting point, um, you've done that investment, and now you can actually make a plan to move forward. And um, you know, I think that is probably the, the most critical point because you don't know what you don't know. And, uh, and I think that, if you do something like this, it uh, it is um, it will help you measure those uh, those successes and create that journey that you need. Yeah, it's a great point because you're baselining as well. You can then use that assessment as a measure of progress as you go forward. Yeah, and I, and I'll just and the last I, I didn't mention, but I would you know another recommendation is do them every two years. You don't need to do them every year, uh, but I think it's important that you measure your. <clears throat> Yes. And so you do one, you make some improvements, you measure, are you actually making those improvements that you thought you were? And then you do it again. Uh, it probably won't be as expensive the second time around, but I think it's important to continuously do those and continuously measure your improvement. Yeah. So if, if you've got a, a fairly frugal budget uh, and maybe you're joining an organization that is less mature than you thought it was, and you start to look around at your cybersecurity team and your capabilities, the amount of work that's required, the breadth of work that's required and, and how busy your internal team is, uh, it can be a little bit overwhelming. And I think a lot of people then start to look around to lean on cybersecurity partners. And so our next question you know, speaks to that point, which is how can cybersecurity partners assist their clients with building strong business cases to gain visibility and funding for uh, a cybersecurity strategy. And Enzo, I know you've spent a lot of time in this area. Perhaps you'd like to, uh, to take a stab at answering this one. Absolutely. Um, you know, ironically, it is an area that um, ISA continues to, ISA cybersecurity continues to invest in, in really understanding the strategic requirements versus the technical tactical governance, risk compliance, and um, the basics that we need to do in order to keep our organizations safe. And so really helping, uh, and I mentioned this in my previous answer, continuing to align um, what your cybersecurity strategy, how it feeds and enables your overall business. Um, I, I love what you said, Sean, about you know evidence, right? do the threat risk assessments and, and understanding where you can qualify and quantify for your business owners who are going to provide some of these budgets, the visibility that they need to understanding, you know, where the risks are. I think Vivian also alluded to, you know, risks and the cost of resolving a breach once it occurs. But that is true of many different systems and environments within our digital landscape. And so crown jewels and applications and how do we protect them? You know, what are we doing around cataloging and the developers that are working in our environment? So what partners can do today is they can help you understand in your industry um, their experiences and what other organizations are doing. They can also provide you the information as to the best of class technologies, maybe not necessarily at the 20,000 foot strategic view, but who are the leaders if we think at our polling question within endpoint and you know why are they the leaders? And not just the industry watch cards, but also things in areas like Gardner peer review 
where you each get to collaborate on your experiences with those technologies, including the cost associated with the change of that technology. The other piece that a good partner can do is to help you realize the value of the investments that you have already made in technology and giving you the visibility as to how those uh, reports, that data, your approach um, in cyber is going to help you drive out what the more critical projects are and what the minimum and maximum costs associated for budgeting purposes. Also helping them, helping you and, and really even your customers understand how do they get started with a minimal budget to ensure that, and you know, Michael, it warms my heart when, when an insurance guy talks tech. I really like it. Um, and you know, but how, how do I get started? So the lower cost, because we're here to talk about shoestring and how can I afford to do the things that I don't necessarily have the money for today. It's really having that multi-step approach to understanding where am I going to get the best value for my dollar? Uh, again, Michael, going back to what you said, security awareness, our people and investing in their knowledge um, and making sure that identity and identity-less access are critical. And then we saw in the panel, cloud, as we continue to migrate both to SaaS, IaaS, PaaS. So leverage your strong cybersecurity partners to be able to help you with what is the baseline cost, you know, because you can buy um, you can buy a Hyundai or you can buy a Jaguar, right? The reality is they both drive you from A to B. How do we ensure that based on your budget and your requirements, you're taking that building block approach to secure your assets, your digital assets, your people, and keep your business out of the bad news that may follow. And Enzo, in just a couple of minutes, um, what what are you seeing on the front lines in the industry? What are people coming to you and having conversations with you about in terms of uh, functions that they may want to outsource? What's what's top of mind for them in terms of, hey, look, I'm really struggling to do all this myself, and I can't make the economics work. Um, let's let's talk about maybe a couple of functions here that I might want to outsource. What, what, what are you seeing? Well, you know, our hosted services um, have really four key areas and they have been driven much by the market demand. So security awareness, hosted service, vulnerability management, that ongoing scanning that Sean spoke about, but to be able to have a consistent uh, view of what's happening in my environment. Um, SIM SaaS, so that we can continue to log and look at future generation logging. Um, and our hosted platform today uh, has world-class technologies powered by IBM as an example. And so really looking at best of breed process, people and technology so that I can augment my skills and my capacity so that potentially I can look at after hours and have practitioners and consultants that know what they're looking for um, working with me or on my behalf. Also the aggregation, when we talk about threat intel and threat hunting, we saw that as well in our poll question. You know, cyber's a sharing game to some extent. Not that we want to share, you know, what's going on in our environments necessarily externally, but we do want to be able to have visibility. And so as we look for managed and hosted services partners, it should give us better visibility to other threat landscapes and understanding of unique business challenges within individual sectors, uh, such as healthcare or utilities, which fall you know, somewhat into our public sector uh, environment where you're governed and you have constraints on budgets. And so really looking at um, having an organization that can help you improve the level of service and your service level objectives while having a consistency in cost always on seems to be important for the market. Yeah, I, I think it also um, goes to company culture as well. There's certain things that certain companies in their culture want to do in house. And there's other things that they're, they're more accepting of outsourcing. And, and a lot of times it's convincing 
internal management that if we did outsource it, it would free up resources to do more valuable things and, and we get better economics that way as well. So it's really interesting. Um, Michael, we just um, scared our audience to death in terms of uh, cyber cybersecurity insurance coverage and the fact that it's uh, the economics are changing and it's uh, difficult and unsustainable in the current model and that we're looking at you know changing wording to make to make this product more viable. You know, let, let's get to the real heart of the matter here. If if I'm a small or medium sized business or a public sector organization. How can I get cyber insurance, cyber security insurance, and how can I navigate this challenge? Can you can you sort of share some insights with us around making this practical? For sure, um, and and it's an interesting question because there's a lot of changes underway that are going to significantly impact this challenge. <laughs> so historically. And I would say still, if you look at the vast majority of the insurance providers out there, the information that they're using to determine whether you're insurable to begin with, and uh, if you are insurable, uh, how much the, they feel like they need to charge for it is based on an application. The insurance industry loves applications. And that application is a landmine field because there are questions in that application that are nice to let information that the underwriter, you know, it's nice to know. And then there's other questions in that application that are need to know. And uh, if you answer the question in the application, no, and what the underwriter deems the right answer to be is yes, that could be the reason why you became uninsurable. So what does that really mean? Well, what it means is that you have to uh, have the right story to tell. So when you're completing that application, you have to be very mindful of how you're completing it. So whoever you're working with as a broker, if they don't understand the questions themselves, be very worried because that when that application goes in, there's a high likelihood that, that, that some of those landmines in that application are gonna go off and you could unfortunately become uninsurable. So you have to, uh, be very careful how you fill out the application and make sure you're answering it. And then there's a lot, in a lot of cases, a lot of information that's not asked for that can be very valuable to add. So for example, if you have had your, uh, your systems audited to some recognizable security standard, well, the application may not ask that question, but that's a really good piece of information to include. You know, um, if you are doing uh, security awareness training and your test and, and that, that question may be in there, but if you're doing testing of your employees to make sure that that training is actually working, that's an additional piece of information that you can add that improves your risk profile. So again, what that additional information that can be added to the application process will vary from organization to organization, but the key message I'm trying to send here is that that extra information can be very critical to controlling the cost or making the difference between being insurable and not insurable. And then I would say the last part of the way I'll answer this question is that I think you really have to, yes, you may want to use insurance as a, as a risk financing strategy in case something happens, I'm moving the financial risk away from my balance sheet into a policy. But I think you really have to operate on a day-to-day -day basis as if you're not insured. And that's what's really critical. Um, so invest in you know creating the right culture and the mindset, making sure that you're partnered with the right organizations that are gonna help you manage this properly, making sure you have the right resources. Um, and the last thing I'll mention about this, which actually I should have talked about in the first point around changes, is that one of the main trends that's happening is that insurers are starting to move away from applications. And what they're doing is they're hiring third-party organizations to essentially do a threat scan and assessment on you automatically. So BitSight for example, is an organization that many insurers are using today where they use off the shelf tools to basically take an external view and see if there's any open ports on your firewall, whether there's any you know, uh, uh, encrypt certificates, uh, SSL certificates that haven't been renewed. They go out to the dark web and they see if there's actually passwords of your employees that have been breached and are being sold on the dark web. 
and because the reason why insurers are doing that is because they're finding that this information is actually a better, uh, allows them to better truly assess your risk profile than the six pages of questions they asked you on an application. So the question is, the question is, do you know what that report's going to say before the insurance company does? And that's what's really important. So having an organization like ISA, for example, who will do those types of scans for you, not only once, but on an ongoing basis is really critical because what you want to make sure of is when they run that report, you want to actually know what that report's going to say before the underwriter does. Because once it's in the hand of the underwriter, the, the picture's been painted. You can't change it anymore. It is what it is. You can come back and say, well, I will address all of those things. It's too late to address these things because in the mind of the insurer, the fact that all these vulnerabilities existed was an insight into your security culture and your mindset. So they say, okay, so you're going to fix all these things today, but what about six months from now? What about one year from now? I don't have any confidence that you're actually got the systems, the processes, the procedures, and the culture in place to do that. So having a, uh, having a, a partner who can do that for you in advance is actually very valuable. Hmm. Fast moving space. Watch this space continues to evolve. I think. Yeah. I'm just going to go off script a little bit here. Uh, maybe go back to an answer that, um, Sean, I'm going to call you out here. You, you mentioned something around uh, an air gap in one of your answers, and there's a little bit of chat traffic going on, some clarifications going on here around. Is cloud backup considered an air gap? Sean, what, what's your perspective on that? Well, my perspective really would be around is that, you know, if you backed it up to cloud, is the cloud, like, if you're connected to cloud through it, whether it's a VPN or however else you're connected, you're still connected in your environment. And so traffic can still traverse that connection into cloud. You need to make sure that your cloud provider is actually storing something offsite or in a, I mean, that's really a question for your cloud providers. Are they storing it in a non uh, connected fashion and air gap fa fashion. So if, if that's not happening, then theoretically that's not true. So you're not air gap. So you've got to make sure you have that conversation and, and really it comes down to when you're sourcing out cloud providers, that should be one of your questions. You know, there's a number of questions you should be asking your cloud provider, but is that, you know, how do they handle that? If they're connected to you, how do they handle that? Um, and how can they guarantee that your backups are air gapped? Yeah, good advice. Um, let's move on to back on script so the organizers are uh, not having kittens. Um, so let's go to Vivian next. Um, so Vivian, the costs of recovering from a breach, we've talked a little bit about that, uh, but I want to dig into it a little bit more. The cost of recovering from a breach often surpass upfront investment in defensive tools. Surprise, surprise. So to avoid those costs, What's an affordable way to prepare for a breach? Right. So a lot of this has to do with understanding what your attack surface looks like, what you already have in your security infrastructure, and are you getting everything that you should out of it? Uh, you know, when we look at those expensive breach components, there's a really high cost in that detection and escalation and understanding what's going on. So obviously, operationalizing your day-to-day -day security practices so that you have early and effective detection, that's really key. And that's gonna be a little different for everybody. You know, for some people, um, you know, whether that's around uh, making the use out of the network monitoring tools you have, maybe adding on some sophisticated network traffic analysis, maybe it's around looking at your identity management and being able to quickly uh, detect anomalous user behavior. Uh, you know, it, for different people, it means different things. It could be as simple as, you know, understanding where our sensitive data is in the first place so that if there's a security incident, we know exactly what controls we have in front of those crown jewels. Um, you know, so it's a combination of understanding your uh, attack surface, where you have your countermeasures in place and how you get the most out of it without necessarily having to spend a lot up front. Um, you know, one of the, the, the slides that I have the, with some of the stats to, to bear this out talks about the mean time to detect and the mean time to contain a breach for Canadian organizations, if we have that graphic available. Um, but here's the, the kicker is that you know in the upper left 
Um, and this is over the five years that we've done the study for Canadian companies. The purple bar is the mean time to identify a breach um, from initial intrusion or reconnaissance until the actual detection. And then the blue piece is the mean time to contain. Um, but when you look at the numbers, you know, we're tracking pretty consistently over the years, not terribly better or worse. And we're pretty much on track with global trends as well as a country, but we're still looking at over 200 days, you know, in the 220 to 247 day range to identify and contain a data breach. And that's what, like eight, nine months? from when the attackers first do that pass or have that initial intrusion into your environment and you actually find it and are able to do something about it. So clearly early and effective detection is really, really important. And you probably have some of those countermeasures in place already and understand what's available and understand what more you could get out of the investments you've already made. Uh, yeah, and the the graph on the bottom right shows like the average total cost of a breach in Canada. And again, you know, we're pretty much in line with global trends. We're not doing significantly better or worse over the years. And, you know, even the dramatic changes in, in the past year and a half with the pandemic and everyone working from home and, and other, you know, things like that. It hasn't dramatically affected how we're doing against data breaches in Canada, um, which says a couple of things to me. It also suggests to me that as our defenses and as tools uh, evolve, right, and, and security technology evolves, and the understanding and awareness and ability of or various organizations, you know, to prepare for and respond to a breach evolves, the bad guys are evolving too. We say all the time that automation begets automation. That's just one example. You know, we're starting to see uh, the bad guys use AI in their attacks as well. So we've got AI in our security tools and there's AI in all the bad stuff as well. So it's constantly changing uh, and you have to understand what is my attack surface and then how do I get the most out of the investments I've already made? The next slide that I wanted to show um, illustrates the, the top mitigating factors in the cost of a data breach for Canadian organization. So everything on the top part are all the mitigating factors, all those things that if you've got it in place, if you've made the investment there, they were able to bring the cost of a data breach down. And then the, the lower part shows the cost amplifying factors. And obviously some of these things require a much larger investment than others, right? The top mitigating factors, extensive use of encryption and having an artificial intelligence platform. I mean, that's fantastic. That's obviously, you know, an investment that's paying off, but that's also a really big investment to make, both in terms of, you know, the, the software costs, the training, the skills, the implementation, the care and feeding of, you know, AI assisted security tools. That's a significant cost, particularly for SMBs and for public sector. But if we look at some of the other cost mitigating factors, not all of these are necessarily a huge investment. Not all of these require, you know, reformulating your security strategy in dramatic ways or trying to hire 20 more security experts. Um, some pretty basic things like, for example, having an incident response retainer, uh, that's a pretty quick win. Uh, that's something I would consider low hanging fruit for most Canadian organizations. If you don't have an IR retainer from a trusted and capable provider and, and a reputable provider, seriously look into getting one. That's having the bat signal. Right. So when something happens, you have those people on call to say, hey, what's going on here? And you get those experts on site. You get all the guidance you need in assembling your fusion teams in understanding, you know, any if there's if it's a data breach, then and what regulations apply, how what's the privacy risk here? Uh, and you have that guidance in you know the, the initial scramble. So would you rather have the bat signal or not is the question that I like to ask. Um, you know, and we look at the cost amplifying factors too. You know, the, some of the, the biggest amplifying factors, the biggest one is just complexity of your overall security systems. And as everyone's making the stampede to cloud, you know, this is, uh, everyone looks at, looks at cloud and how cloud has a lot of benefits, but it also adds a tremendous amount of complexity to your attack surface. Right. So just even understanding what you have, where the, you're having a vulnerability management program in place, understanding where the risks are and anything that you can do to rationalize that complexity 
is is a really you know it is really important. It can have a big effect in decreasing the cost of the eventual data breach or attack when it happens. Yeah, I love that bat signal analogy, Vivian. Um, I'm going to get myself a big uh, spotlight. Uh, in a prior life, I had ISA on retainer and called them a couple of times. And uh, a few folks worked with me through some pretty difficult uh, circumstances, but it's a lifesaver. I mean, you can only imagine if you're in the midst of a breach, just how stressful it is uh, for everybody involved. And your internal cybersecurity teams uh, always get overwhelmed. It is overwhelming. So to have that um, that bat signal and that uh, specialized trained team come in and either augment or take over components of your response, it's an absolute lifesaver. I can tell you that from uh, from real life experience. Enzo, you had a comment yeah. that uh, you, you might want to chime in and uh, augment. Yeah, you know, we want to continue to sort of stay on topic as much as we can. And thank you, Vivian, for showing all these costs. You know, IR planning, <clears throat> not just an IT IR plan, but an IR plan that extends throughout your organization. It is not an expensive endeavor, but it is critical to then being able to do your readiness or your preparedness. Again, not a very expensive engagement to be able to look at, you know, what the information is. And then also cost effective would be to run exercises and different stakeholders through those IR planning exercises so that when there is that very stressful moment and you've declared an incident, everyone pretty well knows what they're doing. Um, ISA also provides a zero dollar retainer where organizations can participate in some of these planning initiatives that I just described, but more importantly, know that, you know, it's minutes away to pick up the phone and ensure that a group of professionals can engage rapidly. And so again, keeping an eye on the cost of some of these services, um, they are quite affordable and will help mitigate some of these much larger number that Vivian has showed us. Yeah, we have a, a question in the uh, in the chat from Raymond around um, what would a small business CIS controls review cost in terms of budgetary planning? Michael, you're probably in the best position to answer that one. What was the question again, Phil? Um, what would a small business CIS controls review cost in terms of budgetary planning? That put you uh, on the spot there. Yeah, controls review. Well, it, it depends. You know, one of the things that we often do uh, with our clients, especially if they are in a bit of a higher risk profile category, is we will do a cyber risk assessment on them initially, where we're really uh, digging into what controls they actually have in place to really assess their insurability uh, and really identify where their key areas of vulnerability are and, and make recommendations. Now, we're not technology people, so we, we always address these things from a risk management perspective, and then we connect them to other parties or partners of ours, like an ISA, for example, uh, who can actually execute you know, on a lot of these uh, recommendations. So the question around the cost is, um, it depends if it's an existing client of ours and, you know, uh, we may do it at no cost. And if it's, uh, you know, a new, a new client and uh, somebody you don't have a track record with, you know, it could cost anywhere from 500 to a thousand bucks. Okay. Sean, you've, you've got some insights into this. You've done a few of these. Yeah, we've done a few. And, and I hate to say, you know, IT is always famous for saying it depends. Uh, and it really does. It depends on, you know, for that in-depth one where you've got technology specialists or security uh, consultants that are, uh, that know the technology. It can, it depends on the size of your organization. If you are a small organization, it can be, you know, um, you know, five to 10 thousand uh, dollars if your medium size up to large it can be 20 25 30 like and above it just it really depends on the size of your organization if you get in touch with organizations they're going to ask how large your organization is how many sites do you have how many people do you have 
you know, are you, do you want to do interviews with stakeholders and stuff and such? So again, it's, it's a lot of labor intensive work and a lot of interviews and a lot of discovery. And that's why what, what drives the cost on those. And that's why we get the, it depends answer. That's right. <laughs> All right. Let's get back on schedule here. Uh, I have one last question, which I would like uh, to ask all the panelists, perhaps again, uh, following our routine, we'll start with you, Sean, but what is the number one recommendation for an affordable cybersecurity solution SMBs and public sector organizations can implement today? Your number one recommendation. So number one, uh, and sorry, I had number two, but I'm going to go with the number one was the, what Michael talked about earlier in his in his four different items is MFA, uh, multi-factor authentication. It's like it's the simplest and easiest to implement. Um, uh, it has a significant impact to the organization in protecting from bad actors getting access to, for example, if you're an Office 365 environment, um, you know, from preventing that happening. Um, People are used to two-factor authentication these days. A lot of organizations like Apple is really big on two-factor authentication. If you're used to that, then it should be no problem going, uh, moving your organization to that. So I would only say that when you do implement that, just ensure you got proper change management processes in place and communicate the importance of the change so that people are aware. Yeah, perfect. Michael? Boy, it's hard to pick just one, and uh, Sean certainly picked a good one. Uh, so I'm going to intentionally pick something different. I'm going to say uh, employee security awareness training. Uh, again, look, depending on the study that you see, um, some studies are suggesting that up to 60% of breaches are really a result of human error, somebody doing something they shouldn't have done. So I really think, and it, it's again, we're talking about on a shoestring. So training is not necessarily a very expensive exercise. And if you can just raise the awareness of your employees and create that security culture within your organization, you can certainly avoid a lot of headaches. Yeah, humans are often the weakest link, right? Absolutely. Enzo, what's your perspective? I like what Sean said early on, you know, the virtual CISO is an opportunity for you to truly develop a strategy that aligns with your business objectives and goals. It also enables you to have a wealth of experience from a cyber professional on a more part-time basis where you don't necessarily need to make the full investment. And, you know, starting to think of things less tactically and more programmatically in your cybersecurity environments, systems, enabling yourself to look at current investments that you've made, but having a virtual CISO that can come in and really help you identify your top priorities, the skills and capacity gaps that you have so that you can uh, you know, reach out to your partner ecosystem and gain access to that to deploy better risk mitigation factors for your business. So yeah. think strategy. And Vivian? Uh, yeah, I think that we've kind of flogged the identity uh, horse <laughs> to death. Um, you know, MFA should be table stakes. You have some kind of identity solution in place already. Everybody does, right? And if you've got MFA, fantastic. Have you looked at how you're managing your privileged accounts? Have you considered passwordless authentication? Because the number one attack vector for data breaches for Canadian organizations is stolen credentials. Almost every single cybersecurity attack involves privilege escalation at some point. So get your identity stuff in order. Um, fun fact, getting that house in order will also help you a lot in most of your compliance mandates too, because while you're figuring out how to let the good guys in and keep the bad guys out, you're also capturing a lot of who can do what, when, where, why, and how. Right. And that's a lot of the compliance piece that also feeds into your overall risk management strategy. Um, interesting thing about this chart, I was surprised when I saw it because the primary attack vectors for Canada don't look like the same trends that we see globally. So this is a very Canada specific view. Um, and I could go down a whole rabbit hole of why I think that is, but that's a, that's a conversation for another day. Um, you know, if you don't want to talk about identity, then I'm going to fall back on the you cannot protect what you do not understand. So if you don't know where your sensitive data is, maybe you should find out. There's a lot of data discovery and data classification tools out there that are not super expensive. And just understanding where all that data has moved to 
even within your own organization, uh, you can't protect what you can't find or what you don't understand. So if you haven't looked at data classification, then that would be sort of the inside out approach that I'd recommend. Yeah, and of course, stolen credentials can be garnered through some of these other things that are on the, the chart here, like phishing and email compromise yeah. and things like that, right? So oh, yeah, phishing works. That's why they keep doing it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So let's go into uh, the Q&A section of our agenda today. I want to try and make this as interactive as possible. Please use uh, the, the Q&A function. We've got some uh, questions that have been lining up as uh, our, our panel discussion has been um, evolving today. Um, so let me just quickly cast my eyes onto the Q&A section and I'll throw out a couple of questions and maybe our panelists can jump in and answer appropriately. So I think we've done the first one. Let's have a look. Here's a good one. So when it comes to cloud, what are the company's number one challenges as well as their number one concerns when it comes to looking at cloud transformation? In terms of cyber, if you're going through a cloud transformation, what are you seeing out there in terms of um, concerns in moving to the cloud from a cyber perspective? Panelists? Maybe I'll I can start in. on this one. Or oh, go yeah. ahead, Enza. Uh, no, Viv, I'd rather follow you. <laughs> All right, Viv first. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so, you know, when it comes to cloud, uh, I, I think that the first thing that people think of when they start talking about the digital transformation is, oh, how much can I save from this? But I personally think that the number one concern should be the shared responsibility model and understanding from my cloud provider you know, what is the RACI? What am I responsible for? What is the provider responsible for? Because there's a lot of nuance and a lot of complexity there. I mean, the, the obvious answer is that you are always responsible for your own data. You always are. Um, so if you don't have a data security program in place and you're looking to move to cloud, you've got to get that under control. Um, but then when it comes to, uh, you know, all it, it, when we talk about threat detection, we're always worried about lateral movement. And that gets way more complicated when you have any kind of cloud footprint as well. So understanding that responsibility model between you and your cloud provider helps you to identify the countermeasures you might need or where your vulnerability program, your threat detection program may need something more than what the cloud provider can do for you. Yeah, and I think that's why Zero Trust is getting a lot of play right now because you're detaching from the from the network and, and essentially obfuscating that lateral movement. So Enza? Yeah, I think, you know, Sean may have alluded to it. It's important to know where your data is and how it's being stored and obviously maintained. And Vivian alluded to that as well. What really is important is there are many security services that are available from our traditional cloud organizations that we are relying on. Ensure that those services are required and it is not a service that you may already have tooled and operating within your own existing environments. Because the cost of cloud when we turn on many of the cyber features tends to really grow quickly. And what you don't want to do, and it goes back to Vivian's RACI conversation, you don't want to duplicate having a feature or function with your cloud provider to enhance your cyber uh, posture if you already have those controls and standards within your own environment. So don't double up. Make sure that the services for cyber specific that you are buying from your cloud providers are not redundant to the systems and tools that you have put in place yourselves. Michael, do you have a perspective on this from a, a risk management and what the insurers are thinking when, because I mean, most companies these days are either cloud native or on a journey to become cloud native at various stages of maturity. What, what do the uh, insurers think about this? They have mixed feelings about it because on the one hand, the great thing about uh, being in the cloud is that you're usually taking advantage of a security infrastructure that's much better, uh, much better managed than you could probably ever afford to do on your own. Now, 
but it, of course, that security is 100% dependent upon how you manage your access. So if, if somebody gets a hold of your administrative uh, rights and can access your cloud platform, well, it doesn't really matter how good your firewall, the firewalls and intrusion detection and everything else that they have really have. The other thing I think that, um, so that's why they, they, they think it's great in some respects, but they're more concerned about how you're managing that using MFA, for example, is a good way to manage that risk. The second thing that they get very concerned about is the backup. A lot of people think just because I have my stuff in the cloud that the cloud provider is backing everything up. Unless you're paying them for it, unless you chose that option on the menu, they're probably not backing up your data. So if it's some, if somehow everything gets lost, it's you, you, you could be thinking that it's all going to come back to you, but it's not. And that's another thing that the insurers are always concerned about. Does, are you, do you really understand what you were getting into when you got into the cloud? And did you really, are you really um, making some assumptions around how things, security backups and things are being managed there? Do you really understand that? Yeah. And Sean, you must have pre pressed a hot button here when you talked about air gapping, because we're back on the air gapping question again. Yeah. Would immutable cloud backups be considered air gapped? Yeah. And truthfully, I don't think I was the one that brought the air gap, but I'm happy <laughs> to, uh, to roll with it. Uh, you know, here's the question is, I don't understand. I don't know. Um, and you know, one of the things that I find, um, and this might be, uh, you know, a difference of opinion uh, with myself versus Michael from an insurance perspective, is I don't think that insurance providers necessarily understand all the different facets of technology and how how things like an immutable backup could be um, could you know help you protect against ransomware. And and so that's a question that you have to have, I think, with your insurance provider. Uh, and dig deep into it, uh, whether they want to or not. And with that third party, um, in my opinion, I think that immutable backup would suffice. But again, it, it all comes down to the insurance provider uh, and if they recognize that technology as being sufficient enough. So that, that would be my two cents. Yeah. I can maybe chime in just a little bit on that, uh, is that, you know, a lot of like AWS, for example, you can, you can get an an air gap backup from them. But what it means is that um, it's a service that you can, you, can, you can choose. And what they will do is they will do a backup that's disconnected from the network. Meaning if you ever want to get access to that backup, you actually have to contact them and they will give you access to it. So it would be very much an equivalent to a backup. But the key is, is that where they're putting it is not on your network, is not accessible through your network. So a lot of cloud providers do provide that air gap service. Yeah, and Michael, while you're talking, there was a, a couple of questions around um, sort of the sometimes the misalignment between your internal risk management people and the risk management people that work for the insurers. And so have you seen where, you know, maybe opinions coming from the insurers versus the opinions coming from the company uh, are different? And, and how do you resolve that? It, it is it is a thing <laughs> because because I guess um, evidence is the answer, right? You have to provide evidence and try to find middle ground. Yeah, and it's and it's it, and it's difficult, right? Because oftentimes the underwriters that we're dealing with that underwrite cyber insurance are not IT people. They're not IT experts. They're certainly not security experts. They're, um, you know, they in a lot of cases they are very knowledgeable people. Um, but sometimes the problem is, is they make very broad brush recommendations that aren't necessarily applicable or appropriate in a very particular situation. So it happens, but all those things can be navigated. Usually it's a, it's a conference call, you know, where we get, you know, the appropriate people on the phone, you know, the insurer will explain what their concerns are that they're trying to get addressed you know, our client will address those concerns specifically with maybe other risk controls that they have in place. And in my experience, we can always come to a solution that, that, that's, that everybody's happy with. Yeah. Um, maybe we can go to Enza. Enza, what are you seeing in the industry right now? If you looked at, uh, if you looked at some of your clients, and I know you can't talk specifically about uh, customers and, and name customers, but what are you seeing in the industry? Are you, are you seeing 
more ransomware? Are you seeing an increased incidence of breaches? Are you seeing people putting money into certain areas? What, what's, what's the landscape looking like in terms of cyber these days? Well, we're definitely seeing um, organizations in Canada moving rapidly to cyber as a service, whether it's managed and or hosted to be able to really leverage the knowledge and experience of a, uh, a good service provider. We're also seeing the top three initiatives that I believe our, our panel um, question identified as well, where cloud continues to be <clears throat> a question as far as future state architectures um, in really understanding identity and identi identity lists environments um, for us to be able to operate. So cloud identity continue to be two areas and those future state architectures that are gonna provide visibility to the investments and the tools and the systems that I have already purchased to understand if I am gathering and gaining you know, the right information from those tools. I'm reporting better to my business. I'm meeting my GRC requirements on a consistent basis. And so looking at, you know, how can I have strong partners that assist? The other key area is really, we talked about it. There's a war on talent and there's a difference in talent today. There are senior consultants who boast 20 plus years of experience in cybersecurity, which means that they started doing cyber was just an infant. And then there are others from an operations and engineering perspective. Organizations are looking for highly skilled professionals to come in to accelerate the delivery of very important initiatives. And so, you know, the traditional um, people businesses that we all know that we leverage in our, in our organizations do not necessarily bring the right level of expertise or the bench that can validate and easily replace any one of these skilled consultants that have been brought into your business. So think about the skills and capacities of specialty partners that can assist you with accelerating your cyber roadmaps. I think there was a question uh, that popped up and I apologize, I may have missed it. So Lindsay or Michelle, you may need to help me out here. But there was a question relating to uh, one of Vivian's slides and maybe I'm not sure if we can pull up that slide and uh, somebody can ask the question uh, on my behalf, I'll prompt the question. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Aaron uh, had typed in the chat um, that he just wanted a little bit of clarification on one of the slides um, that Vivian presented earlier in the deck. So I'm just gonna flip over to there right now. And Vivian, if, if you could uh, just address um, the, just provide a little explanation about that again. Um, and then there was also a Q and A mentioning uh, if uh, the the graphs like where where can people find the graphs afterwards? All right. Right. Uh, so so many charts. So 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 many charts. This is just a <laughs> tiny tiny sample of all the charts. That we we'll flip do. backwards and uh, backwards. <laughs> you know what? Don't, don't yes, even so worry. About, uh, okay. There we go. Um, so yes, all of this data and the reports are totally available. Um, if you want to get into the overall cost of a data breach report and have like sort of a deep dive into the Canadian findings, I'd encourage you to reach out to, you know, whoever at ISA invited you to this webinar perhaps, and we'd be more than happy to sit down together and, and go through that. Um, the, the, I don't remember what the question was about this chart, but yeah, you know, if somebody wants to get into a deep dive around um, what all of this means and and more analysis about the Canadian findings, be absolutely happy to follow up. Yeah, Vivian, the question was regarding the, the colors within the legend and then the chart. If, if you could just explain kind of how those two correlate. Just clear it off for us, yeah, how, how this works, yeah. how the chart works. Yeah, okay, so the, it's a, so the whole for each year, so let's look in the far right for 2021, for example, right? So the total average cost of a data breach was that 6.75 million, right? Um, so the top dark purple portion represents the lost business cost portion of the 
the cost of a data breach. The skinny purple is how much on average people spend on ex post response. The dark blue is the expenses occurred as part of breach notification, whether to customers, to um, authorities, to regulators, et cetera. And then the bottom light blue portion is how much was spent in detection and escalation. Um, I don't make these charts. I am not that good with PowerPoint and Excel. <laughs> I, just, I look at the numbers and I try and figure out the, the trends behind them and the implications for our customers. Um, but that is, that is essentially what this means. Great. Thank you, Vivian. Sean, you're about to start a new job. Um, what's top of mind for you when you walk into your new job, cybersecurity wise? What, what are some of the things that you sort of tick off right off the bat in terms of uh, what, would, what would you be looking at and which areas of cyber would be high priority for you to, uh, to get a read on first? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm actually a week and a half in the new job and uh, and there was a security RFP uh, put out for threat risk assessment, vulnerability assessment, just kind of what I talked about earlier is understanding what, you know, you don't know what you don't know and painting that picture. So, you know, I'm very much practice what you preach. So I talked about that earlier and getting that threat risk assessment. That's something that we will be doing, um, you know, and even just the general hygiene of multi-factor authentication and those type of things ensuring that that's in place, ensuring that we've got cyber awareness training, just some of the easy, again, we talked about these easy wins. Those are some of the things that I'll be doing in our organization. Um, we don't have, I know we don't have formal training, but the security team puts out, you know, they gather information and it's cyber awareness month right now. So every week they're doing the kind of cheap and cheerful and gathering information, putting on a SharePoint site, sending it out making people aware. Um, those are cheap and cheerful things that you can do right away. But, you know, um, just kind of getting an understanding of the organization, getting an understanding where they sit from a security perspective. And that's where that threat risk assessment will really come in so that I can help um, formulate the strategy post that, um, that exercise. And that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Yeah. And, it, and if I was walking into an elevator and we had a two minute pitch, on cyber on a shoestring and I walked in and bumped into Vivian. Vivian, what would you tell me in two minutes that I need to be aware of on cyber on a shoestring? I would say, do you understand what you've already put in place and are you getting everything you need to out of it? Start there, start with what you have. Do you know what you have to protect and where it lives? And do you, are you getting the most out of the controls that you've already put in place? And then if the answer to that is, oh, yeah, I'm awesome, everything's great on that front, then I'd say, okay, well, how well have you operationalized your security? And I, I guarantee you, you know, operationally, operationalizing security practices on a day-to-day -day basis is really, really hard. But sticking to that kind of discipline when you have an incident in progress and things are on fire and everybody's panicking is even harder. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look, Michael's just walked into the elevator. Michael? <laughs> What advice would you give me? Well, you know, I, 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 I'd actually like to take this question and twist it a little bit and kind of go back to Vivian's bat signal and, and a question that kind of came up in the chat, which I think was actually a very good one, which is, you know, uh, one of the great recommendations that Vivian made was, you know, have somebody on the ready, you know, that's going to be responding to these things. And one of the folks chat uh, put in the chat that, you know, the problem is, is you have to use the people that the insurance company use. Well, that's not actually always true. Um, if you don't have a partner, then the default will be whoever the insurance company wants to use that's going to come in and help you deal with the breach and the notification and, and everything else. If you have a partner, like an ISA, for example, you can actually request that ISA be put, put added to your policy so that they're pre-approved. So when that breach actually happens, you're not going to have an issue. You, you'll be able to use the people that you know and that know you and know your systems and know how everything's being managed, et cetera. So, um, so a lot of people don't know you can do that, but I think it's really important to let people know that, you know, if you have a trusted partner, you can have that trusted partner put on your policy so that they will be the ones responding. Yeah. 
Well, we're heading into our time now, our allotted time. I do want to just carve out a couple of minutes. We're, we're going to have a little bit of a, a, a survey that we'd like to ask the participants to fill out before you leave today. But let me take this opportunity to thank all of our panelists today. It's been fascinating conversation. Very interesting to see how we all view the world of cyber from our own perspectives. Uh, very, very interesting. Thank you again for um, participating on our live panel today. It's not an easy job when you're getting peppered with questions. I know that. Um, but it's been a, a fascinating conversation today. Thank you so much. And for the participants um, that joined us today for this, uh, this live panel, uh, please do take a minute to complete this sort of two minute survey. We really would appreciate your feedback. And I'll just say thank you so much, Phil. You did a fantastic job and um, we hope everyone has a fantastic day.